Len, if you could just yeah, let me know. Say it. You see it? Okay, so I'm gonna move on uh, for now before Matt comes back. Um, so I'll introduce, uh, I'll introduce our two speakers today. Our first is Len from Wilkin Gutten Plan. He's a shareholder there and his industry experience focuses in real estate, affordable housing, tax incentives, things like that. Uh, Wilkin Gutten Plan was founded in 1983 and is a full service accounting firm and advisory firm. Our other speaker is Matt Kaplan, who's the co-founder and CEO of Revirio, and his experience lies within real estate, public policy, finance, green building, things of that nature. And Revirio was founded in 2009 and is an energy efficiency and green building services company. Becca, maybe you just keep hosting since I was having issues and we just go from there? Okay. Yeah, I also can give you keyboard and mouse control if you'd like. Okay. Um, let's see. So today we're going to go over the Inflation Reduction Act, which has a lot of different uh, sections of it, but we're going to focus on building energy efficiency incentives and clean energy technology incentives. Uh, we'll cover the Section 45L tax credit and the 179D tax deduction, as well as renewable energy and electric vehicles, and we'll hear from Len about other tax provisions as well. If you have any questions throughout the uh, presentation, feel free to put them in the chat or in the questions channel, and I'll be monitoring that. And if we don't get to them during the presentation, we can take a look at the end as well. So now I'm going to hand it off to Len, who's going to cover the difference between tax credits and tax deductions. Great. Thank you, Becca. And welcome, everyone. Happy to, to have you joining us for your afternoon, um, or I guess late morning, depending upon where you are. Um, so always makes sense to start these types of programs with you know explaining the difference between a tax credit and tax deduction um, because some incentives provide what's known as a tax credit others gives an accelerated uh, deduction um, so tax credits reduce a tax liability dollar for dollar potentially um, can be refundable or they can be not refundable if they're not refundable you know a key is what happens if you can't utilize the whole credit in, in a single year? Do you get to carry it forward, carry it back? Does it just disappear? Um, certainly refundable. If, if you exceed your tax liability, you can get a check from the IRS to, to, um, to use in the business. So credits could be limited. There's different limitations that you can, that we'll discuss throughout the program. Um, you know, one limit we'll talk about are the passive activity losses. So if you have a, passive investor in a project, they may or may not be able to use a tax credit that's allocated to them until they have income from the project or other passive activities. Many of the tax credits that are given require some level of basis adjustment. Uh, many times it's a dollar for dollar reduction of the depreciable basis of the property. Um, some like the solar credit will require a 50% basis reduction. Um, to the extent that a credit is received. We'll talk about that a little bit later also. And there's other credits that have no impact on depreciable basis, such as the low-income housing tax credit. Tax deductions, you know, reduces taxable income rather than the tax liability. Um, you know, the one benefit to the tax deduction rather than a credit is it could potentially reduce a number of different types of taxes. So if you're getting this to an individual return, not only would it potentially offset income taxes, it could offset the net investment income tax, could offset self-employment tax potentially. So even though it's a deduction, you know, you may get more bang for the buck um, by reducing multiple taxes than you would from a tax credit. Um, net losses from a project may be limited. So you have to keep that in mind. If the tax deduction creates a net loss, we're going to talk about some loss limitations later in the program. You may, even though you're getting it, you may not be entitled to use it today. Um, and it could impact the qualified business income deduction um, because of the extent that you're you know, lowering your net income, that 20% QBI deduction would also be limited as well, um, depending upon if you had enough tax attributes to fully absorb that 20%. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to continue with the program. Len, we did just have a quick question in the chat, which is, can the credits be sold to syndicate such as Goldman Sachs, Redstone, et cetera? 
So what you could do is um, set up a partnership to syndicate it effectively, and you'd have an institutional company come in um, to be a partner in the partnership, and you can allocate them tax credits as long as you abide by the safe harbor rules. Um, that's, that's a little beyond the scope of what we want to cover today, but you can do it in that fashion. You can't do a direct sale like you could with New Jersey um, EDA incentive tax credits that you can't use, where you could have an actual cash sale. These are a little different where an outside investor is coming in, giving capital to the project in exchange for ownership. And then usually at some point in the future, you'd have a flip type of structure where you know the ownership flips or there'd be a put option to, to buy that investor out once they've um, obtained all the benefits they are looking for. Um, so good, good question, and it is possible to to structure that. Happy to have follow up conversations with anyone who is interested in more hearing more about that. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so first, we're going to cover the uh, 45L tax credit, uh, which is the tax credit for energy efficient uh, dwelling units. Uh, this tax credit has been around since 2006. Um, but it was significantly updated and modified and expanded by the Inflation Reduction Act. So that starting from January 1st of this year through December 31st, 2032, um, the credit now functions based on different qualification requirements and has different amounts associated with it. Um, you can still go back and claim the prior version retroactively for years before 2023. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about that today. Um, if you were doing HERS ratings with a HERS rater prior to 2023 on your dwelling units, you may be eligible to do that. Um, you can reach out to us if you'd like to discuss, but today we're going to focus on the version of the tax credit that's in effect starting the beginning of this year through 2032. Um, one of the big things that the Inflation Reduction Act did do was extend the credit for a period of 10 years. So um, from 2006 to 2022, um, when the prior version was in effect, oftentimes it would only be extended a year out or it would lapse and then be retroactively extended. And it made it really hard for developers to plan from a planning standpoint to qualify for it, not knowing if it would be available uh, when the units were completed and sold or leased. So the 10 year extension um, that came as part of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, allows uh, developers to have the time frame to actually design and construct dwelling units to meet the standards um, for the tax credit, which have since been updated. Um, as a brief overview, the, the amount per dwelling unit ranges from 500 to $5,000 per dwelling unit. We'll get into the details on that. In order to qualify, it needs to be certified under either the Energy Star program, um, which is from the Environmental Protection Agency, or the Zero Energy Ready Home program, which is from the Department of Energy. Um, and notably, this is for units that are brought to the market um, that are then sold or leased to someone else. So, um, you know, if you are a general contractor working on a project, but you don't own that uh, that project during construction, you're not the one selling or leasing it to an individual, you're not the one eligible to claim it. Um, if you're a homeowner and you're developing uh, you know, your own house for yourself to live in, you're not eligible for the claim it. This is for people that are bringing dwelling units to the market. Um, also, there is a, a modification, uh, which Len will talk more about um, in regards to low-income housing tax credit projects to allow them to take advantage of this credit as well. And, and we'll go into that a little bit uh, further as we go along. So uh, to go into more detail on the amounts and how you go from you know 500 to um, uh, 5,000 per unit. So the first level of tax credit is for Energy Star certification. Um, and Energy Star certification is you know basically exceeding the energy code in your state or city. Um, and then being a little bit more efficient than that, and, and we'll go into details on how you actually qualify. Uh, if you uh, certify the project under the Energy Star program, um, if you are a single family house or ta for townhouses, you're getting $2,500 per dwelling unit. For single families and, and townhouses and duplexes, uh, which count as single family, 
there are no, you get $2,500 regardless of prevailing wage guidelines. It does not apply to single families, duplexes, and townhouses. Um, for apartment units, if you certify for Energy Star, if you do not follow prevailing wage guidelines, you get 500 per unit. And then if you do follow the prevailing wage guidelines, which Len will talk more about, that amount increases, increases to 2,500. So if it's a multifamily project and you follow prevailing wage, you get the same incentive as a single family or townhouse or, or duplex unit does. Um, but even if you don't, you still get $500 per dwelling unit. If you go up to uh, zero energy ready home certification, which as this uh, graphic kind of illustrates, zero energy ready home certification also includes doing energy star certification as well as the indoor air plus uh, certification that you see shown, which is um, an indoor air quality certification that's relatively easy to achieve. Um, if you go up to the zero energy ready home level of efficiency, which is a higher level of energy efficiency than energy star, but also includes everything for Energy Star. The basically the amounts double across the board. So single families, duplex units, townhouse units are getting five thousand per unit. Same with a multifamily unit if it meets prevailing wage guidelines. For multifamily units that don't meet prevailing wage guidelines, the tax credit doubles from five hundred a unit to one thousand dollars per unit. Um, and I mentioned that duplexes, each unit in a duplex would count as a single family unit. Um, and for stacked townhouse products, um, they are generally going to fall under multifamily for this tax credit, though it can vary based on building characteristics. So, Matt, we have a couple of questions in the chat that I'll read out. Um, and while Matt is answering those, I'm going to launch another poll that you can answer while he's uh discussing so the first question is from michael grove and he's wondering if the developer has to be listed with the epa or the department of energy as an energy star builder to be eligible for the credits so when you do energy star you do sign up as an energy star builder that is part of earning energy star certification um, that is a simple and like 10 minute process that you do online um, that's entirely free. So yes, you would sign up as an Energy Star builder if you're doing Energy Star certification, um, but that is should not be an obstacle for for anyone. Um, I don't believe that you register with the DOE to do zero energy ready home certification, but just want to emphasize that even if you do, that's purely administrative and takes a couple seconds online. So um, is not shouldn't be a, a prerequisite that inhibits anyone from qualifying. Another question is from Malka. Um, are any of these credits for homeowners living in the unit or only for units sold or leased? They are only for units sold or leased. That's very important to keep in mind. And they, the credit is claimed by the individual or entity that is selling or leasing the unit. Not necessarily, if, if a different entity, if, you're, if you have developers developing units and hiring a general contractor to construct those units, the developer is the one that claims the credits not the general contractor. And a final question from Anthony. Uh, he wanted clarification that these are all federal credits and not state credits, correct? That's correct. These are all federal tax credits that you claim on your federal tax return. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so it looks like people have had some experience with these programs um, and other certification programs. So, you know, some of this may be, may be familiar, um, you know, to our team. And if you've done Zero Energy Ready Home certification, you, you've also done Energy Star certification as well. So it seems like about half the group has, has done Energy Star certification, whether independently or possibly in conjunction with, uh, with Zero Energy Ready Home certification. Um, so that's good to know that that means, you know, this, you know, there are a lot of, you know, uh, developers who have been doing these certifications for a long time because they like to build this way, they market this way. There's other incentives that we'll talk about for this. And so for those developers who have been doing this, this tax credit is now kind of a windfall if, you know, you're already uh, doing these uh, certification programs and now you're getting an additional incentive at a federal level uh, for this. So that's, that's great. Um, so moving on to how you qualify. You know, we're going to kind of simplify this. Um, essentially, to get Energy Star certification, which is to get the first level of the tax credit, 
Um, first thing you have to do is build to, to energy code. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're just relying on your code official uh, to make sure that you're building to energy code, you may not actually be building to energy code because most code officials don't properly enforce the energy code. Um, but if you're building to energy code and actually complying with the energy code, then it's really only like one or two energy efficiency upgrades um, that you need to, uh, to include in your project um, beyond the minimum code requirements in order to meet Energy Star. Energy Star is, um, it markets itself as at least 10%, usually 10 to 15% improvement in efficiency versus the minimum construction code. Um, and, you know, certain projects may already be including some energy efficiency features, you know, as a part of their baseline specifications um, anyway. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it might only be, you know, one upgrade that you have to meet. It all depends on what your baseline specifications is, are. So, um, you know, some of these energy upgrade options for Energy Star to go above code would be just including Energy Star washers and dryers. Um, it's kind of a common misconception that for Energy Star certification of a dwelling unit that you need to uh, have all Energy Star appliances. That is not true. Um, and so simply by including Energy Star certified washers and dryers um, in the unit that helps, you know, hit the energy efficiency target. Um, other options are high performance windows of some kind, uh, continuous exterior insulation, maybe an advanced wall system, uh, maybe balanced ventilation, such as an energy recovery ventil uh, ventilation system. Um, high efficiency hot water heaters, a tankless hot water heater or a heat pump hot water heater, or for communal systems like condensing boilers connected to recirculation systems. So Energy Star is a, the energy efficiency calculation is dynamic. And so it's not one upgrade or one specific upgrade you need to make. It's, you know, one or two upgrades in combination um, when you do the analysis should help you hit the Energy Star efficiency target. In addition to hitting the efficiency target, Energy Star also has mandatory requirements that you need to follow regardless of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, regardless of uh, the efficiency of the, of the unit. The main one that is often an obstacle, especially for multifamily dwelling units, is that the kitchen exhaust needs to be vented to the outside of the building. Um, and so if you are venting kitchen exhaust to the outside of the building and you have one or two energy efficient upgrades above minimum construction code requirements, um, then, you know, you may easily qualify for Energy Star. And there are a lot of, you know, developers who already have tankless hot water heaters and Energy Star washers and dryers, um, you know, in their, uh, in their specs already. And, and so you may not need to make any upgrades if, if that's the case. But if you're building to baseline code requirements, then, you know, you'd make, you know, a couple of these upgrades. The Zero Energy Ready Homes program, as I mentioned, builds on Energy Star. It's a higher level of efficiency than Energy Star. And so instead of doing one or two of those energy upgrades from the options I just mentioned, um, it's probably more like three or four. Uh, so, you know, maybe a, a high efficiency water heater, a tankless hot water heater, uh, Energy Star washers and dryers, and, you know, maybe balanced ventilation or a high performance window of some kind could could get you there. Um, and it's all going to vary based on the specific project. Um, Zero Energy Ready Homes, like Energy Star, has certain mandatory requirements that you have to follow regardless of the efficiency of the unit. Um, it includes Energy Star, so you also have to vent kitchen exhaust the outside. Um, you have to include low VOC, which is volatile organic compound materials. That's to earn the uh, EPA Indoor Air Plus certification that I showed in, in the prior chart, which is a prerequisite for that. That's very easy to achieve. Um, the hardest obstacle for most projects is in locating the HVAC system and all of the ductwork inside the thermal boundary uh, of the building. So you can't have any ductwork or systems outside of the insulation boundary uh, in order to qualify. And um, that's oftentimes a, a big obstacle, but if you can achieve that um, and there are new solutions coming to the market um, you know, that are helping uh, builders and developers achieve this, um, when it comes to ductwork, then, you know, you can do zero energy ready homes. So this gets a little bit in the weeds, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, 
there are different versions of the Energy Star and Zero Energy Rate Homes program that are phased in over time that you need to meet in order to qualify for the credit. And the timeline for the versions, you may already be doing these programs for other reasons. And the timeline for uh, oftentimes for these certifications is, is based on permit date. But the timeline for the 45L tax credit is based on the acquisition date of the dwelling unit. It's when it's sold or leased. So all of the dates on this slide are all the acquisition date, not the permit date. And so you have to kind of plan accordingly based on when you forecast the dwelling unit is going to be acquired by an individual. So, um, and it, it, the Inflation Reduction Act language left the multifamily Energy Star program and the Zero Energy Ready Home program timeline open-ended to some degree whereas it explicitly listed the versions of the Energy Star single family program that apply. I also just noticed that there's a, a typo there, which we'll correct when we send out the deck. Um, for Energy Star single family, for units that are acquired before 2025, so that's this year and next year, um, it's version 3.1 that you need to comply with in order to claim the 45L tax credit. Starting January 1st, 2025, have any dwelling units that are acquired uh, need to meet version 3.2. So apologies for, for the typo there. Um, you may still be able to certify Energy Star under 3.1, especially in your particular state into 2025, but in order to claim the tax credit for units acquired it starting in 2025, you will need to meet version 3.2. For Energy Star for multifamily buildings, any unit that is acquired through the end of 2027 needs to meet version 1.1 of the Energy Star multifamily program. Starting in 2028, it's possible that version 1.2 will become the requirement for the 45L tax credit. But that is based on when EPA makes version 1.2 effective nationwide. Um, so if they make version 1.2 effective nationwide starting January 1st, 2025, which we don't know if they will yet, then 1.2 would be required for units acquired in 2028 and beyond. But it's possible that that timeline is longer and that it may the transition to having to do version 1.2 may extend past 2028. That is still uncertain. So if you have a project that the units are being acquired before 2028, you can safely plan on version 1.1. If your multifamily project timeline for acquisition of the units extends into 2028, you may want to consider version 1.2 because it is uncertain at this time if 1.2 will become the effective standard then or not. For the Zero Energy Ready Home Program, um, it is certain that before, for any project that has the dwelling units acquired this year, whether they're single family or multifamily, that it will be version one of the Zero Energy Ready Home Program. Uh, there's an asterisk next to version one for multifamily because Version one of Zero Energy Ready Homes only allows multi dwelling units in multifamily buildings five stories or fewer uh, to be eligible. So um, any multifamily building over five stories, so six stories and up, would not be able to certify under version one and will have to certify under version two. The Department of Energy has yet to release version two for multifamily, but they plan to do so this year. The DOE has informally announced that version two will be required for single family and multifamily dwelling units acquired starting uh, in 2024. But the formal affirmation of that needs to come from the IRS who has not yet made that affirmation. And the energy efficiency industry is pushing back on that timeline to transition to version two which seems 
aggressive to us. And so it's possible that might change. But for right now, that's the information that that we have as of uh, as of right now. So if there are no questions on that. Um, then I will uh, kind of move into talking about the process to qualify for uh, for these programs. Actually, back. Do you want to just skip ahead to since this is the wrong slide deck to Len's uh, slide for tax, and then we'll kind of go back to this. I think it might be a sure. good breaking point. Uh, someone asked if version two will allow for taller buildings. Version two allow for other buildings. Version two will allow for multifamily buildings of all heights to qualify for zero injury homes. Matt, do you want me to continue past this slide? To go to Lens tax slide, please. There you go. Uh, thanks, Matt. So section 45L is what's known as a general business credit. So it's subject to the, the rules of um, general business credits, meaning it's, meaning it's a non-refundable credit. So you have to have a tax liability to be able to utilize it. This particular credit comes with a one-year carryback. So if you paid tax last year or the prior year, you know, the, the tax year immediately prior to the year of the improvements or the credit, you'd be able to carry it back to get a refund, or you can carry it forward 20 years before you fully utilize it. Um, if you still have credit remaining after 20 years, those credits expire and you use them. This is one of the credits where you have a dollar for dollar basis reduction of the depreciable property. So if you've got a thousand dollar tax credit, you would have a reduction in your basis by a thousand dollars. When it comes to partnerships and S corporations, the credit is passed through to the owners. Um, and the owners would determine whether or not they're able to utilize them. One thing to note is like I said, the passive activity loss rules, tax credits from passive activities could only be utilized to the extent that there is tax being paid relating to those passive activities. Um, otherwise, those tax credits are, are gated. Um, you have to wait until you have or you are paying tax from those activities. Um, not really going to necessarily impact the developers, but could impact some outside investors. Um, and you know, the, the bonus for prevailing wages, which Matt mentioned. They, we just got a, a tax notice, 2022-61, uh, a while back, and gave us some definitions for how to meet the prevailing wage guidelines. Um, and the way that it was defined in, in the, the tax notice is prevailing wage is defined to be wages paid at rates not less than the prevailing uh, rates for construction in the locality where the project is located as determined by the Secretary of Labor. Um, so keep that in mind to take advantage of the increased uh, tax credit. You need to be make sure you're meeting these prevailing wage rules. Yeah, I'll turn it back over to you, Matt. Len, do you mind? Um, sorry, if we go back to that back end. Do you mind just talking about the either nonprofits and also low-income housing tax credit projects? Sure. So. You know, one thing with the Inflation Reduction Act when it comes to low-income housing tax credits is it, in many instances, it preserved the taxpayer's ability to take the low-income housing credit or claim the low-income housing credit, where normally, you know, qualified basis for calculating that program is going to be your depreciable basis in the project. Um, but for purposes of calculating the low-income housing tax credit, it's um, this particular basis reduction or most of these basis reductions are going to be disregarded for purposes of calculating the Section 42 credit. Um, so it'll help in making sure that those projects are maximizing the low-income housing tax credit that they're able to take advantage of. Um, there's also a number of these programs under the IRA where there was a direct um, an elective direct payment for not-for-profit or charitable entities, and those are going to be any tax-exempt organizations, state and local government authorities, um, the Tennessee Valley Authority, Indian tribal governments, and Alaska Native corporations. Um, and for some of these credits, we're going to be able to allow for them to take a direct payment rather than have to utilize a tax credit, which they would not otherwise be able to utilize. Um, so that's a nice perk for not-for-profits where 
historically it had to actually be a taxpayer to, to take advantage of these types of incentives. Awesome. Okay, so um, how do you qualify for the 45L tax rate? We talked about the requirements to qualify and the efficiency standards and the technical requirements, but what's the, what's the process? So, um, you know, starting in the design stage um, of a new project, you would do energy modeling with software um, and review plans and work with a consultant um, to uh, figure out the material and equipment specifications that you need to include in the design in order to meet uh, the Energy Star uh, or Zero Energy Ready Home efficiency target. So we talked about the different energy upgrades that you could include and the different options. So that would be the process of figuring out which options are best for your project to hit that efficiency target and looking at different trade-offs and looking at the cost of you know changing your water heater, changing your windows, doing things like that and, and figuring out what the most cost-effective way to hit the energy efficiency target is. Um, and then working with that home energy rater um, and it's home energy raters that ultimately issue these certifications that qualify you for the credit uh, or a HERS rater. Um, and, you know, they would then make sure that those requirements are translated and communicated to uh, the construction team um, to make sure that they are properly installed um, during the construction process. Uh, whether that's your in-house construction team or your general contractor, I uh, just want to make sure that the design is properly translated into the construction. Um, and then the home energy or HERS rater comes out during the uh, construction process to verify um, that everything is uh, installed and constructed to meet the design um, intent. Uh, and so that's a series of inspections and, and testing um, that's being performed um in order to verify that and then ultimately issue the certification and then once you have that certification completed you um, can then confidently claim the tax credit for that dwelling unit or dwelling units on uh, your tax return and um, we'll talk about a bit more on the next slide but this process is kind of the uh, best practice process for uh, complying with energy code as well and, and so it overlaps um, you know, with the energy code uh, compliance process. Quick question from Michael. Will the prevailing wage requirement be required for the entire project or can they only be paid to the trades involved in the energy related portions? I think that's more of a Len question. Um, Len, we can't hear you. Somebody. Yeah, for, sorry, I put my uh, speaker on mute. But for, for this particular credit, I believe it's you have to look at it as a project as a whole um, because it's really the end product is the building or the unit or home being um, being built or constructed. So I, I don't think there's certain aspects that you could look to as only being having to pay prevailing wage. So it's, it's a, my understanding is it's you have to look at the project itself. And I do just want to reiterate that the there is the single families, townhouses, and duplex units get the full tax credit amount regardless of prevailing wage. Prevailing wage requirements do not apply to those units. For multifamily units, you can still earn five hundred to a thousand dollars without prevailing wage. It's only if you're building multifamily dwelling units and you want to get the twenty five hundred or five thousand dollar tax credit that you would need to follow the prevailing wage guidelines. But if you are building multifamily units and you just want to qualify for $500 or $1,000 per unit, or for all single family duplex unit and townhouse units, there are no prevailing wage uh, guidelines that apply. So as I was hinting at on the prior slide, the process of qualifying uh, for 45L um, especially for single family houses and uh, small uh, low rise apartment buildings. Um, most of the sunk costs, the soft costs associated with the process that I just explained are already sunk costs to comply with energy code. Um, you know, that would, you know, you would have energy calculations done in the design stage that would replace 
um, you know, doing res check calculations, and that would help you consult on the best specific material and equipment to meet code, as well as to meet the 45L tax credit. Um, and then that those that energy model calculations can also generate permit documents that you would submit to the municipality instead of a res check uh, for permitting. And then the inspections and testing that are completed to verify the 45L tax credit are inspections and testing that are largely required for energy code compliance to get a CO. And so most of those costs are already sunk costs. Um, and so you can leverage those sunk costs that you're already incurring to then qualify for this tax credit incentive. And then if you do that and you qualify for 45L by at least doing Energy Star, in many locations, doing Energy Star itself is a, a bug code uh, pathway in the energy code that is accepted by um, many uh, authorities having jurisdiction or AHJs, basically code departments of states or municipalities, um, as demonstrating compliance with code. So, you know, if you're in New Jersey or if you're in the city of Philadelphia or in other locations, um, you can uh, just show compliance to the code department by doing Energy Star itself. And so, um, there's a strong overlap between qualifying for 45L and uh, qual and complying with energy code. If you are also qualifying for 45L by doing Energy Star certification uh, and possibly zero energy ready home certification as well, uh, you are likely, depending on your location, going to qualify for rebates from utility companies or utility agencies, uh, some of which we have uh, the logos for shown up here. So uh, depending on your location, there may be a statewide agency like NYSERDA or the New, New Jersey Clean Energy Program or a specific utility company uh, like uh, PICO or MedEd that pays rebates for energy efficiency in residential dwelling units. and by qualifying for Energy Star, you are likely going to also qualify for these rebate programs as well. Um, and depending on the rebate program, the rebates range from a few hundred dollars per dwelling unit to, in some instances, over $6,000 per dwelling unit, depending on your location, if you're achieving Energy Star versus Zero Energy Ready Homes as well, whether you're single family versus multifamily. So in certain locations, um, you know, particularly in New Jersey and Connecticut, but also in, in Pennsylvania as well, New York, not so much currently, um, you can qualify for rebates for all qualifying for the tax credit and you can collect the rebate, which is a check sent to you following construction and then claim the tax credit on your tax returns. So your combined incentive for Energy Star for Zero Energy Ready Home can be even much larger than just the tax credit itself. Also, for um, any multifamily building, um, if you are Energy Star certified, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or HUD give you a discount on your um, in your interest rates or your mortgage insurance premiums uh, on your permanent financing uh, up to 0.35 percent or 35 basis points. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, another really strong incentive that you know if you're doing Energy Star, you can qualify for a tax credit of 500 to 2500 per dwelling unit then you can get rebates from your utility company for energy star and then you can also get a discount on your your permanent financing um, if you're uh, refinancing through any of those entities um, so the combined incentives can can really add up for for certain projects um, and uh, you know it's important to also note that um, you know, many of the rebates are also locked in prior to uh, construction. So, you know, you do have certainty about the incentive that you're getting, um, you know, before you start construction. So just to sum up, um, dwelling unit incentive, 500 to 5,000 um, for Energy Star, maybe one or two energy upgrades and making sure you're venting kitchen exhaust to the outside for zero energy ready homes, three or four energy upgrades, make sure you're venting kitchen exhaust to the outside and including all your duct work and HVAC systems and condition space. Um, the There's very little soft costs that are incremental to qualify. 
um, if you're already doing everything to comply with energy code for many projects. If you qualify for 45L, you may also use Energy Star as a code compliance pathway itself. You may also qualify for significant rebates from utility companies or agencies in your locality. Um, and for multifamily buildings, you would automatically qualify for a discount on your permanent financing from HUD, Fannie, or Freddie. You'd also get a discount on your construction financing, but um, it's not super common for developers to use those entities for construction financing, but you would get a discount on your construction financing as well. Most developers are, are using those entities for permanent financing um, because then they don't have to follow prevailing wage requirements during construction. So um, the important thing to make sure that you're exploring all these opportunities early on every project is to engage an energy consultant like Reverio early on in design, um, really before or right at the completion of schematic design, before you start design development to evaluate all the options, do modeling calculations, and or even before that, just qualitatively assess the project and you know see what incentives can be combined and, and see how uh, potentially lucrative the opportunity could be for a particular project. So now we're gonna move on to talking about the 1790 tax deduction. So the 45L tax credit is applicable to dwelling units of all kinds. The 170 tax deduction is only available for apartment buildings that are four stories and higher, and then any non-residential building. So this does not apply to apartment buildings three stories or less, and does not apply to any type of single family townhouse or, or duplex building. Um, this is an allowance to deduct the cost of lighting systems, HVAC and hot water systems, and envelope. Um, in a building that achieves a certain level of efficiency up to a limit that ranges from 50 cents to $5 per square foot. Uh, these amounts are going to be adjusted for inflation. This is a permanent part of the tax code. Um, it doesn't have a, a set time to expire like 45L does in 2032. Like 45L, this tax deduction has been around since 2006. And there is a prior version of it that can still be claimed retroactively. If you built or owned a building that's over 100,000 square feet before this year, and you installed a lot of LED lighting, and you have apartment areas that have all hardwired fixtures and not screw-in lights, it might be worth going back to claim a partial deduction. So reach out to us if that's the case. Um, but unless you meet those criteria or you build like a passive house project or other pro really high efficiency project before this year it's not going to be particularly worthwhile to look back um, and for the remainder of the presentation we're going to be talking about the deduction that's in effect starting this year um, in order to claim this deduction you need to minimally demonstrate 25 percent energy savings for new construction that is compared savings compared to a ASHRAE standard 90.1 baseline. For existing buildings, you can now, it is now uh, based on 25% savings versus the existing building conditions. This was a major change that the Inflation Reduction Act made prior to this year. Existing building renovations still had to meet the same energy standards versus an ASHRAE baseline that new construction buildings had to meet. Now it's just an improvement based on the existing building conditions which makes it a lot more viable for existing buildings to claim this based on renovations that they undertake. So the amounts for the deduction, as we mentioned, range from 50 cents to $5 per square foot, and that's up to, you know, you're deducting the cost of the equipment and materials up to, up to that amount, um, and labor, I believe, as well, up to that amount, so you'll probably hit that cap, but, um, if you are not following the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, uh, which Len will talk about and has mentioned, um, your cap is 50 cents to a dollar per square foot. It starts at 50 cents per square foot if you are achieving that 25% energy savings that I mentioned, and then it scales up linearly to get an extra two cents per square foot up to 50% energy savings, which then maxes out at a dollar per square foot. If you are meeting the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, those amounts are basically multiplied by five. So uh, 250 
uh, per square foot for 25% energy savings, and then an additional 10 cents per square foot for up to 15% energy savings versus the applicable baseline up to, which brings you to a cap of $5 uh, per square foot uh, for those projects. Um, and I'll turn it over to Len to uh, talk about the tax aspects of, of 179D. Thank you, Matt. And 179D is it's an accelerated depreciation deduction. It's not a credit like 45L was and some of the other credits we'll be talking about in a bit, but it's an upfront depreciation deduction of items that would normally be recovered over 39 or 27 and a half years. So it's, it's a nice perk to doing these energy efficient types of programs. Um, you know, the old section 179D used to allow for a partial deduction. You'd look, you'd measure the three different um, building systems and you'd be able to a one third credit for each one that's eliminated. It's all or nothing now. The deduction can be reduced if claimed during a three year look back period, meaning that if you claim this deduction within the last three years, you have to reduce it for any amounts that you previously took advantage of. Um, improvements to public property, the, the, the deduction can be allocated to the designer. Um, so that's important for, for charitable organizations and you know, towns and municipalities. Um, for purposes of REITs, usually REITs are required to utilize the alternate depreciation system. So for purposes of this specific deduction um, and for purposes of earnings and profits calculations only, only for REITs, the deduction is allowed in the place and service year so that the so that the REIT can retain the cash from the tax savings. Um, and we mentioned the bonus for prevailing wage and apprenticeship programs. We covered prevailing wage earlier, but for the apprenticeship program, you know, it's it's determined based on a percentage of the total labor hours um, worked by apprentices compared to the total labor hours for the project. And it's a phased in regime. For projects that began prior to 2023, it's a 10% requirement for apprentice hours, 12.5% uh, for projects began prior to 24 and after 2023, and 15% thereafter. So if the project begun, begins after 24, the requirement is 15%. So keep those in mind for that, for that increased deduction that Matt um, described a, a slide or so ago. Now I'll turn it back to you, Matt. Thank you, Len. So um, how do you qualify for this 179D? So for new construction, you're being compared to the ASHRAE 90.1 baseline. And um, we'll talk a bit more later in the presentation about what the baselines are, um, but you may be able to simply comply just by building to energy code because the current ASHRAE 90.1 baseline that you're being compared to, that you need to be 25% more efficient than, is uh, a much uh, less efficient baseline than the energy code in most locations in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region. So it is possible that simply by building to the energy code in New York, Connecticut, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, Washington, DC, Maryland, uh, that you are already gonna comply with 179D without any of energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and that will be the case uh, until, uh, 2027. Um, so there is this sort of opportunity over the next few years to easily uh, claim this deduction. Um, you may have to do one or two energy upgrades depending on uh, the applicable energy code. Um, and that could be anything from high performance windows. Uh, a lot of the things I was mentioning before for 45L, you know, continuous exterior insulation, advanced wall systems, balance ventilation, such as an ERV, uh, high efficiency water heaters of some kind, um, and so, you know, you, you may need one or two of those upgrades to qualify, or you may qualify simply by building to the, the current energy code um, that you are, uh, that you're building to in your state. For existing buildings, um, you know, it would be one or two upgrades that could be things like LED lighting, um, same thing with the high performance water heaters or high performance windows, could maybe be upgrading your HVAC equipment. Um, you know, the 25% is 
on a whole building basis. That was lowered from, Len mentioned they got rid of the partial deductions, which is true, but it also, in order to claim the all or nothing deduction, it used to be a 50% savings. That was lowered to 25%, and they kept the baseline the same until 2027. And so it became a lot easier for buildings to achieve the entire deduction with this change, even though they eliminated the, the partial deduction. So the process for comp complying for new construction for 179D is similar to the process to qualify for 45L for new construction. It involves energy modeling and consulting during design with a consultant to tell you what efficiency level you're achieving based on your basis of design and what material and equipment upgrades you should include in, in order to, to achieve the efficiency level or increase the amount of the deduction. You may already be at the 25% energy savings building to energy code, um, but then you may um, you know, want to increase that deduction um, by increasing your energy savings up to 50%. Uh, so you would work with a consultant during the design process to do that. And then the uh, consultant uh, would then, uh, which in this case uh, would be like a licensed professional engineer as opposed to a FERS rater for 45L, um, would then do inspections of the completed building uh, not so much inspections during construction, but more like a finals uh, inspection at the end of construction uh, to then provide you with a written confirmation of energy savings. For existing buildings, you would quantify your energy usage, um, you know, by uh, benchmarking uh, the building, uh, which would be utility usage you'd uh, obtain from the utility company. Um, and, you know, many buildings of this uh, size and type are already benchmarking to comply with local benchmarking regulations in New Jersey or Philadelphia or New York City. Uh, so that data may already be obtained. You may already have this benchmarked. Um, and then you know, you'd start, okay, here's our baseline. You'd work with a consultant to uh, model the, uh, the projected savings um, for your planned retrofit. Um, and if they're achieving the energy savings target, you would make, implement those uh, retrofit uh, measures and then the consultant or engineer would uh, do the inspections to verify that and um, you would then quantify the new energy usage through benchmarking uh, on the back end and then ultimately um, you know be able to uh, achieve uh, the deduction based on that um, and on the new construction side um, the energy modeling that would be done uh, does can also be used for for energy code compliance um, in certain locations, um, it may be hard to pass like an envelope comp check um, with the new reference envelope uh, values and new energy codes being a lot more stringent. Um, and so you may want to trade off envelope efficiency with mechanical system efficiency, which the energy model allows you to do. Uh, so you can maybe have, you know, more windows in your project or use less efficient windows. Um, also, the new energy codes in certain locations require energy recovery ventilation in dwelling units as a prescriptive requirement. And if you use an energy model to comply with code, um, you can avoid having to do that, which you may want to. So there are some other applications of the energy model for energy code for 179D. Uh, so you can take advantage of those as well and, and try to leverage the soft costs for both code and 179D compliance. So as I was alluding to, um, you know, Prior to 2027, the ASHRAE baseline uh, 90.1 standard is 2007. Um, so, you know, most states um, in our region, the energy code is either ASHRAE 2016 or ASHRAE 2019. Um, and so there's a new version of ASHRAE that comes out every three years. And so, you know, it's, you know, the, you're building to a code that's four or five code cycles ahead of the applicable baseline for any building that's completed through 2026. And so over the next three years, there's an opportunity for developers and building owners to you know, pretty easily claim this deduction. Um, that's gonna get a lot harder starting in 2027 when the baseline standard becomes ASHRAE 2019. Um, and you know, that's gonna be a, a, a exceeding 25% energy savings compared to 2019 ASHRAE standard will be a lot harder. Uh, the energy codes will also have increased by then. Um, and, you know, generally the 
you know, these, these baselines are national, but the energy code versions in uh, the region are usually ahead of, you know, what the national baselines are because of the geographic area that we're in and, you know, how it's governed. And so, um, you know, there, there'll be a consistent opportunity to kind of leverage energy code compliance uh, to qualify for um, the 170 tax deduction, but that uh, require that benefit and that ability to do that is particularly uh, appealing over the next few years. Um, and the next slide just kind of demonstrates this. Um, you know, you can see on here that ASHRAE standard uh, 2007 uh, is denoted, and then since then there was 18 and a half save 18 and a half saving energy savings from 2007 2010, and then from 2010 to 2013. ASHRAE standard got 7.5% more efficient. And then from ASHRAE 2013 to 2016, it got 6.8% more efficient. And then if you're on 2019 code from 2016 to 2019 code, uh, ASHRAE got another 4% more efficient. So, you know, you don't really add up percentages, but you look at, okay, it improved by 18.5%, then 7.5%, then 6.8%, then maybe another 4%. Exceeding ASHRAE 90.1 2007 by 25% may not at all be difficult um, for, for many projects that are being built to ASHRAE 2016 or ASHRAE 2019. Uh, so as I was just mentioning, um, you know, for the next few years, you, you should be able to easily claim this deduction um, as long as you do the energy model. And, you know, starting in 2019 or 2027, it will get harder when the baseline standard is changed to 2019. Um, but the codes in our region should considerably outpace it. So you'll usually always kind of have a, a head start. Um, so, you know, another reason to, you know, maybe use energy modeling as opposed to com check in your design process for energy code and then also qualify for this deduction in the process. Um, just like with 45L, if you are qualifying for um, 179D, there are a lot of local rebates. Uh, programs from utility companies, utility agencies that will give you rebates for achieving those energy savings. And you can combine those rebates with the tax deduction. Sometimes those rebates can be well over a dollar per square foot themselves. And so, you know, there's a real opportunity to, in our region, to say, okay, we're already building to stricter codes, so it's easy to qualify. And then in our region, there's a lot of incentives for this stuff at a local level, and you can combine those local incentives you know, with the uh, with the tax incentives to, to maximize, uh, you know, your overall incentive package. Um, I'm not going to go into it very much, but there's also uh, commercial property assessed clean energy financing programs throughout the region that will also um, provide you with financing options um, based on achieving the energy savings uh, that you'd be achieving qualifying uh, for the 1790 tax deduction. I'm going to jump in here with a little bit of a pulse check, so I'll launch another poll. Um, asking if you've ever pursued Section 45L, 179B, both or neither. I'll give that a minute so everyone can respond and I'll, I'll show the responses. Looks like about half of you have answered, so feel free to click off which one applies to you. All right, I'm gonna close the poll now, share those results. And feel free to take, take, a, take it back here, Matt. Okay, um, I know we're running over. We'll try to get through the rest quickly. Um, we're almost done with 1798. Um, so um, you, it's possible that for apartment buildings, four stories and up, that you might be able to claim 45L and 179D on the same building. You can claim 45L for the dwelling units if they're achieving Energy Star at, or Zero Energy Ready Homes. And then you can also deduct uh, the cost of the uh, you know equipment and materials uh, that are helping to contribute to the energy savings for 179D. Um, that is allowed based on the legislation. We're waiting to see if the IRS issues any rules that disallow this. 
um, but for uh, developers and owner of multifamily buildings uh, that are four stories and up, this could be a particular, particular opportunity to claim both the credit and the deduction, as well as local rebates, as well as discounted financing, as well as CFACE financing. Um, so, you know, just wanted to highlight the fact that now um, that mid and high rise apartment buildings are eligible for 45L, they can theoretically um, be claimed alongside 179D on the same project. Um, so to wrap up on 179D before we turn it over to Len to talk about the clean energy um, incentives, um, the 179D deduction is $5 to 50 cents to $5 per square foot for developers and building owners. It's for new construction and existing buildings. For new construction, you may be able to qualify just by building to energy code for the for next few years. For existing buildings, you might want to make one or two energy retrofit upgrades. You may be able to claim 45L and 179D together for mid and high rise apartment buildings. If you do 179D, you can also use the energy model you create to show compliance with energy code to give you more flexibility on the design of your envelope and to avoid the prescriptive energy recovery ventilation requirement for dwelling units. Um, you may also qualify for local rebates from utility companies and agencies. You may also qualify for CPACE financing and as always engage an energy consultant early on in the design to evaluate the opportunities that you have uh, before continuing with the design of the project. So um, sorry for going over, I'm gonna turn it over to Len now to cover the uh, clean energy tax credits. Great, thank you, Matt. We'll cover these pretty quickly as I know 45L and 179D were the two most critical to communicate with everyone. But you know, part of the IRA was an extension of the deadlines for beginning construction um, for these for certain improvements to qualify for the credit. Uh, for most, it's going to be for projects beginning before for construction beginning before 2025. For geothermal, goes out to projects beginning before 20, 2035, and then certain solar and wind facilities or wind improvements go out to projects began before 2032. What they effectively did is they took what was a very simple credit and they made it a lot more complicated by creating a much lower base for the credit. Um, and then adding multipliers and increases to it, depending upon what you're doing with um, where you're putting the project um, and how you're how you're taking care of getting it constructed. So the new base amount for solar geothermal is going to be six percent, two percent for other properties. It was originally a thirty percent credit for solar geothermal that was been in a, that was in a phase out where. Projects beginning before 23 were at 26% and beginning in 23 were at 22%. Now you're going to see we're going to get back to that 30% credit where you get to multiply the base credit by five times if the project's maximum net output is less than one megawatt. You meet the prevailing wage or apprentice and apprenticeship requirements previously discussed, or construction begins less than 60 days after the IRS issues guidance. Um, Go to the next slide, Matt. So then there's also a few different uh, add-ons here. So the credit is increased for use of com component materials produced in the US. It's a 10% increase for small projects and prevailing wage apprenticeship comp compliant projects, 2% for other projects, and a 20% increase for low-income housing projects. Um, the basis reduction here is 50% of the improvement property that qualifies for the credit, um, or 50% of the credit, I should say. I apologize on that. So 50% of the tax credit is a basis reduction. So it's not as punitive as the basis reduction for 45L, but it's also not as great as the you know no basis reduction for low-income housing projects. And note that this is another one where you don't have to reduce your qualifying basis for purposes of calculating the low income housing tax credit, even though we're reducing depreciable basis. There's also a number of states and localities that offer renewable energy incentives. So keep those in mind also as you're pursuing the, the federal tax credit in these types of projects. Um, also worth noting on, on that last one, it applies to both of these credits, um, is that these, all, these qualify for that direct pay initiative for not-for-profits that I discussed earlier. So keep that in mind. So 
For EV charging station tax credits, the credit has been extended through 2032. Um, this one works similarly to the um, efficient energy, the, the renewable energy production credit, where it's a 6% credit for depreciable property. Credit is increased to 30% if you use the if you meet the prevailing wage apprenticeship requirements. The credit is limited to $100,000 per item. This is a significant increase from the pre-Inflation Reduction Act law. So this is very significant potentially, um, especially for those where you're installing multiple items. And it expanded, it's expanded to include biodirectional and two, two and three wheel charging stations in addition to you know, the more traditional charging stations for four, for four wheel vehicles. So in order to be qualified for this credit, it must be located in an eligible census tract. The census tracts are either in a low income community um, or is not in an urban area. So depreciable basis is reduced by the dollar amount of the credit. It's treated as a general business credit. Um, for purposes of tax exempt entity, the seller is entitled to the credit. Um, property must be used in the US. Local incentives for EV chargers in many locations, which can be combined with the uh, the federal tax credit as well. I know New Jersey has some programs specifically, so keep that in mind as you pursue these to also look at the, the state and local incentives that may be available to you. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the excess business loss limitation. This is one that applies to non-corporate taxpayers, so it's gonna to apply to individuals, estates, and trusts. Um, is part, this is part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So this isn't new news, but what's new is the limitation was extended as part of the IRA through 2028. What effectively happens here is if you have a net business loss in excess of $500,000 for married filing joint taxpayers or $250,000 for other taxpayers, um, single individuals, trusts, um, estates, if you have a net business loss for the year that you would, other, other, would have otherwise been able to deduct on your tax return, you get capped at the $500 or $250,000 limit and any excess losses beyond that get converted to a net operating loss deduction that's available in the following tax year. So they don't want you to be able to take a net business loss and offset um, you know, wage income, investment income, other types of income that an individual estate or trust may have. Um, so keep that in mind as you're thinking about some of these, you know, incentives, especially the accelerated depreciation deduction of 179D. And a couple of other minor provisions that I'll I'll just throw out there quickly. I, I don't know how many it would apply to on the call, but there's now a 1% excise tax on the repurchase of corporate stock. It only applies to um, Corporations traded on a securities market, and there's a 15% corporate minimum tax on book income as part of the IRA, which only applies to corporations with average book income exceeding a billion dollars. So I, I don't expect that to apply to many on this webinar, but just you know wanted to have all the tax aspects of the IRA covered. So the webinar is scheduled to end at 12:15. I'm not sure if it's going to close us out. I'm trying to extend the time period. If we lose you, that's anyone, if we don't until then, if, unless we get kicked off, does anyone have any any questions? All right. It's seeming like it's not going to kick us off, which is good. That's good. Um, you can either raise your hand and I'll unmute you, or if you want to just throw it in the chat, that's also an option. And thanks for sticking with us, even though we went over time. Uh, I did see one question, Matt, while you were presenting earlier. Can a project already under construction start the process to claim the 179D deduction? Definitely. It definitely can. It's easier to do that for 179D than for 45L, but even for 45L, it's possible if you haven't sheetrocked the building. For 179D, it's very possible because um, there's no like required verification prior, you know, during the rough stage of construction. So absolutely a project that has already started construction can still uh, qualify for 179D. Um, you would just, you know, if, if you know, you would just do the energy model now and then do a, an inspection at the end of construction uh, to verify everything. 
anybody has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And Becky, can you throw the uh, question slide up too that has our contact info also? We're not getting kicked off. Thanks to everyone bearing with us today. There you go. So if anybody, so if anyone does have, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> feel free to start with this contact information. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat or any raised hands. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you, Len, for all your expertise. Thank Hi. you, Matt. Thank you to everyone for joining us as well. It was uh, enjoyed presenting. One final question. Uh, have nonprofit developers been able to utilize the 179D tax deduction, such as transfer the credit to a for-profit partner? So what happens with 179D is the designer can actually take advantage of the deduction. Um, so you know you can work that into your, your pricing with the designer. Um, and they can uh, they can take advantage and because they're getting a tax break hopefully that will help with some of the pricing for a for a not-for-profit all right well thanks matt and len uh this has been great thank you becca for hosting and thank you everyone look forward to hearing from you in the future and have a great day take care everyone